Welcome everyone to Grace Saskatoon's online gathering. This is the gathering for Grace Fellowship Saskatoon on July 5th. My name's Chris and uh, we're just excited to have you with us today to continue our journey through Hebrews and what we're learning right now in Hebrews 11 is primarily how to walk by faith. And so Murray's going to come up and share with us the next set of verses from that and dive into the study of that. But I'm just going to pray first to get us started, and then we'll jump right into his message. So God, I just pray for us today as we're receiving your word through Murray. I pray that he would be speaking uh, not necessarily the things that we want or hope to hear, but uh, some things that are new, some some learning that we can glean from this, and and also some things that are hard to hear that cause us to to think and uh, reevaluate. Because uh, we often we often think that we know everything, and and we don't, and we also don't know the best ways. And uh, just like the people that we're learning about in Hebrews, specifically this chapter. Uh, today in the last couple of weeks. Uh, These people are the same as us, and we like to think of them sometimes as these great people, but uh, they struggle the same ways that we do, and and we need our our faith to grow. Um, We need you to help us to trust you, and uh, so help us to know that not just in our heads, but also in our hearts, and so be leading us into place of humility and, and, and acceptance today as we, as we hear from Murray. And yeah, we just thank you for this opportunity to gather and, and we pray this in your name. Amen. Good morning. I'm excited about this passage of scripture as we've been journeying through Hebrews chapter 11. And and this portion is just packed with truths that I think uh, I really need to hear again and again. And I hope will be beneficial to you. So so we better get going because there's a lot to cover then this morning. Now, I'm not going to mention any names, but, but there was a university student all stressed out, um, you know, in anticipation of this notoriously difficult final exam in his ornithology class, you know ornithology, right? The study of birds. And so this guy just crammed and studied, I mean, gave the ultimate effort in this course all leading up to this final exam. But when he walked into the classroom to take the test, instead of sort of the multiple choice, the short answer, maybe a few essay questions that he expected, there was no test materials in the room at all, just 25 uh, pictures of Uh, on the screen, and they weren't just photos really of of birds and all their colorful plumage, but rather just pictures of birds' feet. The test then was to identify 25 species of birds by their feet. So the students is going, you know, this is insane, right? Uh, Without batting an idea, uh, batting an eye though, the professor basically said, this is the final. Well, I won't do it, the frustrated student said. I'm, I'm out of here. Prof says, well, if you walk out of here, you fail this exam. Well, go ahead and fail me then, the, the, the boy said, headed for the door. And the prof goes, absolutely, you have officially failed the course. Give me your name, the professor demanded. And the boy just pulled up his pant legs and said, you tell me, professor, you tell me. Well, today we're going to learn about another incredibly stressful test that Abraham had to endure and undergo. In fact, it, it seems extreme, it seems unfair, but those who have faith in God trust his heart. That God actually has purposes and designs in everything he does that abound to his glory, that are ultimately for our good and for the world's ultimate good and joy. And Jesus, too, and in, in, I think it's in the Sermon on the Mount, he, he tells the story of, a, of an ultimate test, too, where, where faith's object or foundation gets exposed. He, he tells the story of two builders, right, two homes. 
And Jesus says in the nice, comfortable days, right, you really can't know their foundation. When everything's going smoothly, uh, you wouldn't really be able to tell the difference between the two houses. It's only when tested in a storm. And one house stands, and the other is devastated and destroyed, that the real and eternal differences start to come to light and are seen. Well, for Abraham, the biggest storm of his life was coming. So here's our scripture, Hebrews chapter 11, verses 17 to 22. Reading from Hebrews chapter 11, verses 17 through 22. By faith Abraham, when he was tested, offered up Isaac, and he who had received the promises was in the act of offering up his only son, of whom it was said, Through Isaac shall your offspring be named. He considered that God was able even to raise him from the dead, from which, figuratively speaking, he did receive him back. By faith Isaac invoked future blessings on Jacob and Esau. By faith Jacob, when dying, blessed each of the sons of Joseph, bowing in worship over the head of his staff. By faith Joseph, at the end of his life, made mention of the exodus of the Israelites and gave directions concerning his bones. Well, let's remind ourselves what's been going on in Hebrews, right? I mean, life has gotten extremely difficult for these professing followers of Jesus. Some of them were being persecuted for their faith in Jesus. Some of their dearest friends had even fallen away uh, from following Jesus. People are actually looking at them and considering them crazy for their obedience of faith. And they've had uh, a lot of unanswered questions starting to, you know, crop up in their minds. Like, wh what's God doing in this? Why is he doing this? Why is this happening? And some are even starting to wonder, is God even real? And so the writer is telling them, that there's no way they're going to make it if they don't honestly believe and, and truly believe that following the God revealed in the scriptures, the God revealed to us in the person of Jesus, is worth it. He is worth it. So in chapter 11, he's going to give this all these examples of broken people who did not quit looking to and trusting in the Redeemer that God would send as their hope and salvation. And we're going to see here in, in verse 17, and we're also going to see it in Genesis 22, where we're going to spend a lot of time as well, where this event gets recorded in detail. And it tells us here that, that God was testing Abraham. God has already tested Abraham before. And for the most part, Abraham was coming away with sort of 50s at best. You know, he was passing, you know, but barely. And he definitely failed a number of tests along the way. He had to have a few rewrites, and he failed a few of the rewrites too. Um, so this next test, though, for Abraham, this was going to be the biggest and most intense one yet. And tests both show you and grow you. They show you and they grow you. It, it shows you where you're at. Shows you where you're at in a particular area. And then it challenges you to gain wisdom and to grow, to, to be better. And contrary to popular belief, now I know some of you, because of your own school experience, you're going to find this hard to believe, but, but tests are not given to fail you or to, to beat you down into despair. You know, bring the numbers down. That's the way the devil tests you. I know some of you are thinking my math teacher was the devil. But... Good teachers are trying to show you where you're really at, where you need to grow, where you've got some things wrong for your good. And this is the way God tests. Now, Job's a good example of someone tested, right? Job goes through great tests, and you've got the devil on one side hoping that the test will show he doesn't truly trust God, doesn't truly love God, so that he'll turn from God in despair. And God, purposing those very same tests, to draw Job even closer to him and showing him Jesus, the ultimate righteous man who suffered as part of a greater plan for our good and God's glory. So Hebrews 12 says, in fact, no discipline seems pleasant at the time, but painful. Later on, however, 
It produces a harvest of righteousness and peace, but not for everyone. It says, for those who have been trained by it. So the benefit is only to those who rightly respond to the test. Now, I've probably grown some in the easy times, but in the trials, it's in the tough times of life. That's where my faith has been tested, and that's where I've grown the most. That's where I've actually benefited the most. In the midst of a tough test, though, it can, it can get a little confusing because uh, we're not always thinking rightly. We don't always have the right perspective. And so we go, well, doesn't God promise that, that not a hair of our head will be hurt? But how does that fit with a diagnosis of cancer? Or doesn't God promise to meet all our needs according to his riches and glory? Then how come I can't get a job to secure my finances to pay my bills? Or We're called to serve and to love and obey God as a powerful, loving, good, and wise king, despite the fact that with my eyes at times, what I'm forced to walk through doesn't seem like it's a pathway of blessing, according to my limited sight. So, so God knows we need a perspective shift, and he loves us enough to help us get there. And maybe you find yourself in a situation where if you in love tell the truth, you, you'll lose your job or maybe lose a relationship. Or it, it feels so right to give in to my sexual desires, yet they don't line up with God's commands. You know, it feels so right to get revenge or cut off that relationship to pay back evil for evil. Yet God says, overcome evil with good and that vengeance belongs to him. You see, when my desires are really at odds with following God's ways, that's when the test has arrived. When God brings something into your life that actually crosses your will or your desire, then the test of what your heart really believes, what you really treasure, has arrived. Why would God call me to forgive? I mean, after what they've done to me. Right? Or why would he ask me to forsake my sexual drive when, when I'm not married or if I have same-sex desires? And, and why would he call me to go against that which feels so right, so natural, so fulfilling? See, this is Abraham's test as God tells him to take his son and offer him as a burnt offering in Genesis 22. Now, I can't imagine a more difficult test than this one. Right? And Abraham's got to be thinking, but God, you know, why would you give me a promised son in whom all the promises that you have for the world are bound up in him and in him having an offspring? How can the Savior come if he's dead? Right? This burnt offering is just, it's going against my very nature as a dad. Right? This just feels like death to me. And Besides, in a burnt offering, that meant you gave it all. I mean, there's nothing left over after a burnt offering. You gave completely. We do have to remember, this is not a command to, to murder Isaac. Because if that was the case, Abraham could have just done that in the tent, right? Stabbed him in the tent, it would have been done. It's clear, though, that the wages of sin is death. And Isaac, as a sinner, he is under the penalty of death just like us. And God can command and demand its execution and its payment at any moment. So it's God's mercy that the deserved condemnation is held off. I mean, I got up this morning. It's a gift of God's grace. I got no right to today or tomorrow. His mercies are new every morning. It's a merciful gift from the Creator that I've sinned against. And God doesn't just say, take your son to Isaac or to, to Abraham about Isaac, right? No, he says in Genesis 22, verse 2. So if you're there in Genesis 22, 2, he says, take your son, how's he put it? Your only son, Isaac, whom you love. And go to the land of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains of which I shall tell you. I mean, Abraham had waited and waited for years because God had said, I'm going to give you a son through your wife, Sarah, who will be your heir. In fact, 
Abraham was 99 years old when Isaac was finally miraculously born, which means on their next birthdays, right, Isaac was going to turn one, Abraham would turn 100. So they probably both got diapers for their birthdays. It, Isaac's birth was special because he represented the faithfulness of God. In him was the future, both, both in this life, for there was no old age security, no pension, right? Your son would take over the farm. He'd be the one then provide for you and your spouse in your old age. But not only was Abraham's future at stake, in this promised offspring was the future of all the people of faith. For through him would come the promised delivering king, the savior of the world. And Abraham loves and he lives for his son Isaac. Abraham was old enough to be his grandfather or even his great grandfather. And I know how possible it is to, to idolize your grandkids. And this child quickly becomes the delight and idol of Abraham's heart. And as he'd watch him grow from, from, you know, from uh, babyhood to a young man, the heart of this old man would just be, be knit together closer and closer with the life of his son, his greatest joy. I think it would have been a lot easier for him just to, to give his own life, right? But the agony in his heart to be tested is, take your son, your only son whom you love, and offer him as a burnt offering, which is offering your first fruits. I mean, this is your very best. Could this man, think about it, who struggled and failed to release his grip on his father when God told him to leave his father's house, could he now release his grip on his son? And now that both Abraham and Sarah are over a hundred years of age, you really can't expect one more miracle child than one in your lifetime. Tests really do expose what is ultimate in our hearts, our idols exposes our true loves, what it is we truly worship. And God is after Abraham's full devotion, his full heart and trust, just like he is after ours. In Genesis 22, verse 4, it starts out with this time frame. He says, on the third day. So true faith, we see, is, is not simply shown in the initial yes on the first day, but it's the ongoing yes on the third day. Loving Isaac is not a bad thing. It just cannot be an ultimate thing. And we know because we've seen the end of the story that God never actually intended Abraham to slay his son on that day, but actually to destroy the evil of idolatry in Abraham's heart because that evil would eventually hurt Abraham and Isaac and all the others that are close to them. So Abraham, now in his mind, in his own thinking, he thought that God was, was preeminent in his heart. But now in this test, by faith, he actually makes the shift and actually makes the shift in the center of his heart from Isaac to God. And Isaac, now he's not a toddler, he's, he's in his early 30s most likely because Sarah, soon after this, she dies and she's now 127 years old when she, at her death. So he is a willing sacrifice. And in this, Isaac too learned that he is not preeminent. He is not the golden child on the throne, right, with the world revolving around him. This was so crucial to Isaac to strengthen him and keep him from being entitled and self-absorbed. Abraham and Isaac both committed to not be at the center on that day. And this was an agonizing, this had been a painful test, but it's oh so needed and so transforming. Now when we look at the three verses in, in Hebrews 11 regarding this test, we see that to pass this test, Abraham started by reasoning. This is something we've been saying all through the chapter, right? This is where faith begins. Abraham considered, Hebrews eleven nineteen uses that language, right? That, that deep reasoning and thinking, right? He starts considering reason that God could raise the dead. And figuratively speaking, 
he did. It does not say that Abraham reasoned that God would raise Isaac from the dead, but that he could. Now, many today believe that faith means you have to believe that God, that God would do this, but that's not faith as revealed in the scriptures. It says in verse 19 of Hebrews 11, he, that's Abraham, considered that God was able, that God was able even to raise him from the dead. Not that he would, but he was able to do it. So faith lets God be God. We do that because we trust his heart. So faith says, not my will be done, but yours be done. And Abraham then steps back from the situation. He looks at the big picture. He, he considers what he knows about who God is and what God has already done in the past. And that big picture helps him see that there is nothing more reasonable than to obey God. It, it can look crazy if you narrow that picture down to just one small piece of the puzzle. But if you stand back, and actually look at the whole, it's a different perspective. And this was not Abraham's first test, right? This is not his first rodeo, right? He'd been told to leave his family and home to go to a place that he would receive his inheritance. He was told to settle down there. He was told that God would provide uh, a son to him through Sarah. And in all of those tests, Abraham did not fully trust and obey. He stepped into the pool, but he always kept sort of one foot on the bottom. He always kept one hand on the, on the edge, one hand on the side. And Abraham, right, when he was called to, to leave and cleave, he was called to leave his home and family and cleave to God alone in faith dependence. However, when he first left Ur, Abraham only went as far as Haran, just a short distance away, so that he could stay with his father and with his, his kindred, his family, right? So he didn't obey and leave his father and kindred. He didn't depend just on God. No, it wasn't till 11 years later when he was forced to because his father had died that he finally set out for the land for which God had told him to go. And then he hardly settled down there when a drought hit. And where does he do? He doesn't turn to God. He goes to Egypt for refuge. But the Egyptians, they're not really as good as trustworthy as God. And so he ends up having to lie about his wife being his sister because he doesn't really fully trust God to protect him and provide for him. And he's just not free to be real about, real about God, reveal about who he is and his faith in God. And in the years of waiting then, too, for the promised son. His, his patience wears thin, it, it, and he tries to make it happen in his flesh by sleeping with the slave woman, Hagar. He ends up having a son by her, which causes a whole lot of problems. And now in this test, as Abraham walks for three days to where God is leading him, he reasons, he considers, he considers in the past, right, he goes, every time you, you asked me and called me to do something, God, I thought I was wiser than you. And every time I veered from completely following you, I made a mess of things. This time, he determines, I'm going to trust you completely. I will not be fooled again. You're capable of raising him from the dead, Abraham reasons, right? Maybe it'll be a literal resurrection, maybe not. I'm not going to try to figure out everything in advance. But I've learned, even though it doesn't look like a desirable thing, but seems like a really just painful and costly thing, seems like a death, but I've learned if I trust and obey, if I trust and obey fully, you always have a plan and a purpose. I trust you'll somehow bring glory and redemption out of this because you're a redeeming God. So Abraham reasons that it's always good to trust and obey God fully, even if he doesn't see how it could possibly turn out for good. Well, back in Genesis 22, verse 5, it says, Then Abraham said to his young men, Stay here with the donkey. I and the boy will go over there and worship. Interesting word he chose. And we will come again to you. So it's we he's talking about. Abraham was convinced that somehow they were both coming back because God had a promise to fulfill. We continue in verse 6 of Genesis 22. 
And Abraham took the wood of the burnt offering and laid it on Isaac, his son. And he took in his hand the fire and the knife, so both they went, both of them together. And Isaac said to his father, Abraham, my father. And he said, here I am, my son. He said, behold, the fire and the wood, but, but where's the lamb for a burnt offering? Abraham said, God will provide for himself the lamb for a burnt offering, my son. So they went, both of them, together. In Hebrew, that word together is ikad, which literally means united as one. So that means Isaac is a willing offering where he goes, I obey, God will find a way. And this helps us to see what Abraham has been doing for those three days. He has been considering, he has been reminding himself of the character and promises of God. He's probably thinking back maybe to that encounter in Genesis 15, right, where God took responsibility for both sides of the covenant. The only thing that can drive you forward in the difficult times is not the strength of your character, but an unwavering conviction in the goodness and promises of God, in particular seeing God's commitment to the covenant that he has made with us, to the point of his own death, to his bearing the ultimate curse for our disobedience and failure. And then the second thing Abraham did to pass the test was to look to the Lamb. Was to look to the Lamb. As they reach the top of the mountain together, the Son of Promise himself is carrying the wood up that hill. And Abraham tells his beloved Son, God will show us the Lamb he will provide. Abraham, by faith, reasoned based on what God had already revealed to him. Some kind of redemptive payment must be possible. God will do it. He will show us a way in which he can both be just and the justifier of those of us who have sinned against him. Continue, verse 9. When they came to the place of which God had told him, Abraham built the altar there and laid the wood in order and bound Isaac his son and laid him on the altar on top of the wood. Then Abraham reached out his hand, took the knife to slaughter his son, but the angel of the Lord called to him from heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham. He said, here am I, gladly, I'm sure he said that. And he said, do not lay your hand on the boy or anything to him. For now I know that you fear God, seeing you've not withheld your son, your only son from me. So God stays his hand. And it's clear that Isaac is now out of the center of Abraham's heart. Where in all the previous tests, Abraham had only partial obedience. Now he's actually learned to trust God with no holding back. And here he is in unconditional surrender. In verse 13, it says, And Abraham lifted up his eyes and looked. And behold, behind him was a ram caught in a thicket by his horns. And Abraham went and took the ram and offered it up as a burnt offering instead of his son. God, the redeeming God, provided a substitute. The ram in a thicket, right? Caught by its horns, right? It, so it would have these thorny branches, right? Just crowning his head. Crowning his head, thorn of thorns. And here on Mount Moriah, Abraham was shown, and he saw the Lamb of God, and 2,000 years later, Jesus said this, Abraham saw my day and was glad. He said that in John chapter 5. So verse 14 says, So Abraham called the name of that place, the Lord will provide. As it is said to this day, on the mount of the Lord, it shall be provided. So interesting to me that this place is called the Lord will provide. Not see how Abraham obeyed. No, this is not testifying to Abraham's or our commitment to God, but God's commitment to us. On the mount of the Lord, it shall be provided. Future tense. He does not say in reference to the ram substituting for Isaac, it has been provided. That's already occurred, right? No, he was seeing the lamb that God would provide on this same Mount Moriah, a lamb named Jesus, whose name means God is my salvation. And now we shout, on the mount of the Lord, 
it has been provided. Past tense. See, we look back 2,000 years to the event that Abraham looked forward 2,000 years to. And both he and us find in the Lamb of God our salvation. So Abraham, he looked behind him to see that ram because there was one coming after him, right? And we now look the other direction again to that same lamb. And so we look to the day that that day that the Lord has made when another one and only son whom the father loved would walk up that same mountain. And again, that son would willingly crawl up upon the wood And it was on that same mountain ridge, Mount Moriah, upon which the temple was built, right? The temple, that's where all the sacrifices, all the priestly pictures that we've seen throughout the whole book of Hebrews, all the blood spilt that could not provide, but only point to the one who on that same mount where the city wall cut through that mountain ridge to make way for the wall. And outside of that, on that piece of that mountain ridge, Mount Moriah, it looked like a skull. And there another son descended from Isaac, carrying the wood for the sacrifice, willingly walked up that mount. But this time, no substitute would be provided because he himself was the unblemished lamb. And he is seen under a thorny crown. And he would willingly lay himself on the wood. He, he stayed on the altar in a form of a cross as the father plunged the knife of justice for our sins into his heart. There was no ram to substitute for his son. For he was the sacrifice. He was the lamb of God. His life for mine. And he cried out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And no angel interceded or stepped in saying, stop, stay your hand. There a father, the father, offered up his only son, whom he loves, his firstborn son, in whom are bound up all the promises, all the blessings. This is the heir. The father did for Abraham what he had asked of Abraham, so that Abraham didn't have to. There is a real picture in that. After this test in Genesis 22, the Lord God says to Abraham, because you have done this, you have not withheld your only son whom you love. I know you love me. And then God blessed Abraham and told him all the nations of the, of the world would be blessed through a coming offspring, through this offspring. And we know now, when we behold that offspring, Jesus, on the cross, we can declare this. And now we know that God loves us because he did not withhold his son his only son whom he loves, from us. So as you face that struggle, that test, where you're called to obey, behold him go up the mountain. We see how he loves us. And if he's willing to give up this for me, anything he calls us to is nothing compared to what he has done for me. So what should we say to these things? God is clearly for us, or as Romans 8.32 says, He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also with him graciously give us all things? Now at the end of this test, Abraham now possesses nothing. He no longer owned anything. Oh, he he got his son back and he still had everything that he had before to enjoy, but he no longer owned them. And they no longer possessed his heart. He had everything, yet he possessed nothing. It was all God's. You know, for us, it just seems so natural to consider things as ours, right? As mine. And it seems so natural that we don't even consider how evil it is to actually take the place and role of the Creator who owns it all, rather than our rightful spot as creature. We're given so much to enjoy, but we're owners of none of it. For having God as our treasure, 
We have everything our heart could have ever longed for. And and that's the great freedom of having God and being fully satisfied in him as our treasure. Because now Abraham can truly love Isaac because Isaac's no longer possessed as the ultimate treasure and idol of his heart. But now he's actually enjoyed as a gift from God, a gift that actually leads him closer to his father. Okay, we got to breeze through the next three testimonies from three broken families. But through many tests during their lives, many trials, many failures, here at the end of their lives, God is going to commend them because of where they finish in faith. So in all three cases, we're just given a, a brief statement. Each of these men at the very end of their lives, having pressed on, Uh, living in faith in God to the end. And they hit the tape, right, the end of their race, even though they'd stumbled and fallen a lot of times, right, during the race. uh, Their eyes were not on the finish line, though. Their eyes were actually looking beyond the finish line. And they just saw that finish line as the next beginning of the next true and ultimate leg, which is what I want. Remember, it's not just saying yes, initiating faith in Jesus. It's the endurance and growth in that faith to the end. These men all die in faith, not having received the promises. But God's promise did not die with them. Even as they approached death, they saw the fulfillment of those promises in the coming offspring in their heart of faith, in the distance, and they embraced that day Right? They didn't embrace their current circumstances or what was right there. That was the day they were embracing. Then their bodies would end up laying in the grave, and there await the day when the promised Messiah would come and pay their sin debt on their behalf. And then they'd have to wait some more until all God's people would be gathered in, when along with us, who live by faith in the Son of God, who loved us and gave himself for us, they hear the voice of Jesus. That day when that voice will come, Isaac, arise. Jacob, arise. Joseph, arise. Murray, arise. Time to get up. Enter the joy of your Lord in the better country, in the new heavens, in the new earth, In the fullness of my kingdom, Jesus says, all rebellion and evil vanquished, including death itself. So these three men, they die in faith, knowing that death would not be the end of their journey of faith. And in faith in God, they invoked future blessings on their children, believing that death would be swallowed up in victory. And they passed on the good news of Jesus Messiah to their children and commended to them a life of faith in the true and living God. So verse 20, here's the first one. By faith, Isaac invoked future blessings on Jacob and Esau. So this is Isaac. This is the son who walked up Mount Moriah, carrying the wood for the sacrifice, who was told by his father Abraham that God himself would provide the lamb. He spoke a blessing to his sons. Right? First, he thought he was blessing the older son, Esau. Right? But through deception, Jacob ends up stealing that blessing. Jacob, the deceiver, the heel grabber. Right? He covered himself with the favored son's clothing. Right? And so that Isaac, who is now old in years, dim in eyes, right? he, could, he could smell the aroma of Esau, the favored son, and then he would bless him. And so Jacob covered his hands, he covered the back of his neck with, with, uh, make it feel like he was hairy, like hairy Esau, and he provided them the sacrifice, the meat that would delight his father. But we can't deceive the Ancient of Days. He is not dim in his eyes, right? His eyes pierce the darkness. Nothing is hidden from him. But we don't have to steal the blessing, for God is a rewarder. He's a rewarder. He desires to bless us, and so he takes on human flesh, and he sacrifices himself to cover us with the righteousness of of God's own favored and beloved son so that we can get the blessing that he deserves. We're, 
we are now in Christ and in him. We smell like Jesus to the Father. We, we feel like Jesus to his touch. And we're loved in Jesus and blessed in the favored son. We, we are blessed and even as Jesus deserves to be blessed. And it's this, none of this is done deceptively. In fact, this is done by the design of God in the gospel. We're blessed for Jesus' sake. The favored son has, has brought us near to also receive favor from God as beloved sons and daughters. Verse 21, by faith Jacob when dying, blessed each of the sons of Joseph bowing in worship over the head of his staff. So we got Jacob, that, the deceiver, that scoundrel, the thief. How is he among the ones commended by God? He too is saved by grace. He's an heir of the righteousness that comes by faith in Jesus. His righteous standing has been earned by another, Jesus. His many sins are not seen here in this passage. That's because they've been nailed to the cross and he bears them no more. So they don't show up in the new covenant passage here in Hebrews 11. This is the better covenant. I love that Jacob is on this list because then there's hope for a scoundrel and sinner like me. And God doesn't love us then because we're good and beautiful, but he loves us to make us good and beautiful. And though Jacob and his family, they, they do end up in Egypt and they're going to bear great hardship and even slavery, Jacob proclaims they're blessed for they have something greater than the wealth and treasure of Egypt. They have the gracious love of a heavenly father who chose to love them and bless them. Though it seemed like things were going in the wrong direction and they would all die in Egypt, yet, verse 22 says, by faith, Joseph, at the end of his life, made mention of the exodus of the Israelites and gave directions concerning his bones. His bones. Yes, Joseph said, Keep my bones for the next 430 years. And when God delivers us, his people, carry my bones with you to that land as a symbol to all of my faith in the God of resurrection. Joseph did not have the promised land as his finish line. No, he was looking for a better fulfillment. One day, the Redeemer will come. He will conquer death and all who've put their faith in him will one day be raised in the new heavens and new earth. One day, many years into the future, another Savior would come and walk that same path that Joseph walked, even into Egypt, but he'd walk out of Egypt. And he'd be betrayed, and then lied about, and falsely condemned. And of course, unlike Joseph, Jesus wasn't just sold into slavery. He was put to death. And that death, would be our salvation. Despite being given over to death like Joseph, Jesus would be raised from that pit to sit on the highest throne of the land. And like Joseph, instead of exacting vengeance from that throne, he would use his exalted position to forgive and to save his guilty brothers. And like Joseph, he'd weep tears of joy when we were reconciled to him. Like we read in Genesis, though Joseph's brothers meant what they did to him for evil, but God designed that very same evil for good, for the salvation of many people. Oh, how true of the cross, right? That most, that most evil sin in all history, the creatures mocking and killing the creator come to them in grace and love. And God designed that very evil to accomplish the greatest good the saving of many people. What a legacy. The whole point of this is not to dazzle you with Joseph's faith or to bring out a lesson that, that as long as you avoid the aggressive cougars in your life, then, then you'll be Prime Minister of Canada one day. No, the whole point is to show you that in all things, God is fully in control. He's in control of all history. He is working out his perfect plan, putting Jesus on the throne and save and glorify the church through his resurrection. So the main point is that God will put Jesus on the throne, the one who is wise and good and loves us, and he wants us to know that we need Jesus on that throne of our heart and life. 
And we're told that he is in ultimate control, just like in the life of Joseph. God didn't save the nation of Israel despite Joseph's suffering, but actually because of it, through it. And Jesus saved us not despite his wounds, but through his wounds. And Jesus calls us to follow him through many dangers, toils, and snares that will bring about his purposes. And that's why we need faith in Jesus to obey him and persevere in faith to the end. Jesus, think about it, through his life, he was tested. If he had just had a smooth life, right, it would be a lot harder to trust him. But we see his life from the messy beginning to fleeing the country, living as a refugee in a foreign land, to losing his dad, being misunderstood, mocked by his own brothers. His cousin, whom he loved, was murdered. He was rejected, betrayed by a close friend that he had loved and poured into. He was tempted by the devil himself, falsely accused, lied about, hated, though he only loved. He was physically and mentally abused and ultimately crucified in the most humiliating, torturous death. He was publicly shamed, crucified naked on a filthy Roman cross. And he passed every test, and not with 50s and Bs and Cs, but perfectly loving God, his Father, and loving his people to the end. The tests reveal what's beneath the surface, what's real. And Jesus, he's the real deal. And may our tests be used to purify our faith so that we keep it in the one who stands strong and who loves us to the end. Let's pray. Thank you, Father, for just oh, all that you've done. We thank you that you and your son were the, were the only ones who, who ever really had the full horror of the test come down on them. And you passed. You passed for us. We thank you, Father, that you walked up that mountain with your, with your only beloved son, whom you love. And you laid him on the wood, and there was no way anyone could stop you. And you did that for us. And we just pray the knowledge of that would just transform us. Help us to see, like Abraham, that you're both a God of command and promise. And we need faith to obey you fully even as we trust in your promise. May the meaning of the sacrifice of your son change us and just release us from our idols and keep Jesus, the true and ultimate son of promise, as the very center of our heart. We pray you would affect all of this in our lives by the Holy Spirit. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, thank you for joining with us this morning. If this is one of the first times that you're tuning into our online service, there's a link in the description of this video wherever you're watching that will send you to a few songs on YouTube as part of a playlist that has been curated specifically for this Sunday and this Sunday's message. So please take a listen to those songs, meditate on them, uh, reflect on how they connect with what you just heard and saw. And after that, we will be starting a Zoom after party. You can join the gathering over there. And we hope that those of you that are gathering this way can enjoy that aspect of the face-to-face -face connection. Um, it's uh, just hope that you're encouraged through conversing with one another about what you just listened to in the message and updating each other on, on what's going on in your lives. And speaking of which, we just want to offer a quick congratulations to Jay and Kira Fife on their marriage. It was yesterday, but uh, it's, it's never too early to come alongside a new couple and to encourage and walk with them. And so just congratulations there. And thank you for joining us today.